What's made you stay true to you? It's gotten you in trouble in some cases, but what Absolutely. makes you stay true to you? I don't mean that's the only way you can, I guess is the way I was raised. Mm -hmm. And it's the only way you can have a, an authentic relationship with God, period. You gotta be true to who you are at all times. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, we wanna move that truth piece out of there, but it's the most important piece because that's what God can work with. God can build great things with raw material. Something is true. And so I may be a little rough around the edges at times, but I like that about me because it keeps me, you know, <laughs> you know, not forgetting where I come from. I look at my kids like, I'm from the hood of Detroit. I was born in, uh, on the east side of Detroit. It was rough, you know, our public uh, schools in Detroit. And so I had to learn how to, the streets, I had to have street savvy. My kids have no street savvy. They, they're, they're suburban kids going to private schools. And I tell them, I got to take y'all to Detroit and to the hood so y'all can have some edge about you. <laughs> you know I like saying? that. We, I think everybody just need to keep that edge about them, you know, because it, it, it'll keep you sharp and, and it make you understand you're still in spiritual warfare. You're always in the fight. Absolutely. There's always some kind of devil trying to take you down, you know. So it's, that's a good to keep, it's good to keep your edge. How did you weather the storm of the criticism? Oh, I, I, I've been groomed for that since day one. You know, they, you know, I, I've always been a different type of person. I'm clear on that. I'm not your <laughs> average guy. And I, it started with my mother just saying, Dietrich, you gotta, you gotta be you. You say you wanna wear that, wear it. You wanna spin around and do that when you sing that song? Spin, long as you do it to the glory of God. Why are you doing it? Well, I think, you know, I feel it. I, I was raised to be bold in who I am. And uh, I'm gonna tell you, here's, here's a story, a good story. I told my mother, I'm called to preach. I heard the voice of God. I was 10 years old, 10 or 11. She said, you called to preach? We're gonna put you right up to preach. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, I need to study a scripture or memorize something. She went and got my robe and got my Bible, said, get ready to preach, you got one week. I said, mama, I don't know. I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> Whoa. I got up there, man, and I sang my song. Jesus, I'll never forget what you done for me. Church went crazy. Church was packed to capacity. Right. And when I got done singing, I read my scripture and I went blank. I didn't know what to say. I was looking at all my friends' faces. <laughs> <laughs> my dad said, you better say something. <laughs> Boy, you better preach. I, was, I don't know how I got down from that platform to this day. But after that, all my friends were laughing. And I said, I'm going to learn every Bible scripture, every verse. And that motivated me to know the Word of God. And I took over my Sunday school class. My teacher didn't have to teach. I taught every week. I told every nuance of the story I knew. Now I get up to preach it. I'm never at a loss for words. It took that moment, though. It took that one moment for me to say, I'll never go through this again. Mm. And so now when people got something to say about me. I just remember, now that's just somebody laughing. They don't know. I'm going to get better. It's going to get better next time. They don't know me. You know. When did you know you had a voice? I was singing a duet with my brother Gerald. Shout out to Gerald Hatton. And it had to be about seven or eight or something like that. And so we, we were singing, I don't feel no waste time. And uh, uh, for some reason, I said, let me walk this aisle and sing. So I said, I don't feel no way time. And my brother, when I looked back, he was way back there looking at me. And the crowd was, <laughs> sing, Jimmy, you better sing. I said, Gerald. Come on, we singing, Doc. We got the crowd. He said, oh, no, oh, no, I'm not doing that. That's when I realized, okay, he's scared. That's not him. He got on the piano and, and excelled as a producer and a keyboard player. And so I can't do what he does and he can't do what I do. But when we come together, it's incredible. Your range is incredible. What, what? The vocal range? Yes. Man, something happened to me true story uh, when I went through the toughest season of my life I was in New York City in front of 10,000 people they come to Dietrich Hatton's in concert Bishop Hezekiah Walker introduced me I walked out they were screaming I went to sliding across the stage singing my hit song but the second song my voice went completely out I mean I couldn't whisper 
I said, y'all want, my voice is gone. Y'all want me to continue to sing? I'll stay here and talk? They say, stay. So I went, the DJ just played all my songs, but I couldn't, I couldn't sing. And while I was on stage, I said, God, forgive me for this arrogance. I've been. Mm. <laughs> something, something, it's a reason why. And I, maybe a month I went on concentration. The next time I went on a show, Burl probably remember this. I was singing, man, and my voice just unlocked. I was able to hit a range I've never hit before, like in the heavens. And I did it one time and the crowd said, whoa! <laughs> and I said, let me try this again. Ah! They said, I said, let me try it again. No, no. And it was there. Like, my friends would tell you, Dietrich don't sing like that. Yeah. <laughs> I used to sing in a group called Perfect Peace. I was the vamp king. I like to say yes. I like to squall, mm -hmm. not to do falsetto. I used to tell them, man, y'all singing all up the high like that. No, let's sing there. Yeah, we, we were singing rough. <laughs> you know? Then a one day, it's almost like God said, because you humbled yourself, I'm going to give you another layer, add another layer to your gift. I love that. And so that's a true story. I will never be the same. First off, let's start there. You've got, yes, sir. I've heard two songs in the last few weeks and months. Never be the same without yes. you. Okay. My Tell favorite me. song. I've been <laughs> dropping bombs since the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. I started with The Lord Will Make a Way Somehow. Okay. Al Green remake. Yes, 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 yes. That's my favorite. What made you redo it? Well, I actually sang it on Sunday uh, before I preached. Oh. And uh, the church went crazy. I posted it up the next day. Mm -hmm. It went viral. And they said, you better record that song now. <laughs> I said, I'll record it. <laughs> I went and recorded it and put it out and people just loved it. I woke up, it was like, like 500,000 views. And yeah, I mean, people really wanted that song. So I said, you know, I think it's because of the times we're living in, people need to know that the Lord will make a way, some kind of way, you know. We started out the year with Cat Williams just throwing, <laughs> taking oh, out, take he, everybody he out. took out the trash <laughs> in 2024. So everybody's like, the Lord make a way. So the song was right on time, you know. I love it. And then which came after that? Never Be the Same or Without Never you. Be the Same, which is my single at Radio Now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that song is incredible. Um, I sang, I wrote it after I preached. Mm -hmm. And uh, I usually just flow when I'm uh, singing something, you know, the song of the Lord after I preach. And mm -hmm. it just flowed, you know. And I was, when I finished the album, I said, I'm done. And my armor bearer at the church, David Walker, shout out to David Walker. Uh, I was headed back from the studio. He said, man, your, your record's not done. You got to record that song, Never Be The Same. We sing it every Sunday, man. Oh. I said, oh, man, that's just a church song. Don't nobody, you know. But I recorded it, and I love it, and it embodies the entire uh, body of work. So I just think it's an incredible song, and it happens to be the first single at Radio Right Now. I heard you say that when it comes to gospel music, many have lost their sound or their voice. What did you Ooh, mean by that? You don't get me in trouble. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think I understand what you said. What did you mean by that? I came up in an era where you could identify the artist right away by their signature, signature tone or harmonies and even their fashion style. I'm from Detroit. It's the gospel music mecca. Mm -hmm. So for contemporary gospel music, mm -hmm. the Winans, the Clark sisters, uh, commission, which were contemporary gospel pioneers. They're still sampling Clark Sister records. Oh, Beyonce absolutely. is sampling. Jay-Z is sampling mm -hmm. Clark Sister records. Uh, the, li the list goes on. Vanessa Bell Armstrong, Thomas Whitfield, you name it. Yeah. These were pioneers. And th I just believe in that. Like, we shouldn't just fall in sync into a certain uh, sound, but be you, you know, and, and, and be bold about it. And that's why the Clark sisters were so, they made such an impact because they were them. Mm -hmm. Twinkie wrote her songs the way she wrote it. The harmony was the way she, you know, and you just knew it. Commission, Fred Hammond, yeah. you just knew it. And so I'm still, I call me old school because everybody <laughs> want to use the auto tune now. And just, you know, it's all sounds the same. Mm -hmm. And so, and uh, I, I just have to be 
an ambassador for that. Like really just stand up and keep that rhythm going, keep that sound, keep your style. Let me see who you are as an artist. Let it come through, you know? And uh, yeah, I'm an I'm a, uh, advocate for that. I have to say that that is true because the moment I heard all of the songs that you mentioned, the newer ones, it, there was no denying that that was DJ. Right, right, <laughs> and right. I, no one had to tell me who I was listening to. You know, I'm not gonna get to. come this far and lose who I am. Mm. No, no, I've, I've been successful and, and I've been doing it over 30 years. And so I'm not gonna lose my sound. I'm, it may progress mm -hmm. and evolve over time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's going to be me. I'm going to approach it the Dietrich way because I know how I need to get up and sing it in front of a crowd, how it needs to be presented. So I always do that. And so uh, now it seems like, I don't know if it was a radio situation, whatever. When things tend to become successful, everybody starts to lean that way. Mm -hmm. So we went through this era where it was more like just... Uh, don't worry about what you got on. <laughs> you know, just get up there and sing, oh God, you know, just put on your baggy clothes and run around and everybody get in the group and sing. It's cool. And that was dope, like Maverick City. Yeah. Super dope. But that's them. That made us say, that's them. We love that. That don't mean that we want everybody to start doing that. This is where you started life. This is where we moved when I had to get away from your father. He went crazy and started beating me. I knew that I wanted to protect my children. Something I've learned that I didn't know, uh, I knew you were part of Preachers of LA, but I didn't know that it was your idea. Oh, they finding out now. <laughs> <laughs> People are finding out that Preachers so, was my creative so that idea. Was your idea. <laughs> it really was. What happened? What made you think uh, that? Oh, man. I was going through the toughest season in my life. I got a call from a great preacher by the name of Zachary Timms. Mm -hmm. And I was crying on the phone, man, literally. Man, they go, I'm messed up, man. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll never be able to preach or sing again. He said, calm down, Dietrich. You ain't the first and last. Mm -hmm. Now tell me what's going on. So he helped me on that phone call. And after the call, it just hit me. Man, we just need to do a reality show, man. And let people know how real men of God that are anointed by God, called by God, can make mistakes. Even good people can make some bad decisions in your life. You can expect to live... 90, 100 years and not make, make a mistake. You're mm -hmm. not gonna make all the best decisions. So why am I so hard on myself? And I realized, okay, we gotta break this religious spirit. And there are many people that have gone through it that there's nobody showing them the blueprint to, to come up out of it. Yeah. yeah, You know, so I said, I'm, I'm willing to put my life on the line and put it out, bring the cameras in so people can see. Would you do it? Zach said, I'll do it. He didn't live to, to be able to do that, you know, uh, rest in peace, Zach Timms. But it was that conversation with him that birthed uh, Preachers of LA. I took it to Holly Carter, which mm -hmm. was my manager at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Holly's about that business. Yeah. <laughs> Holly going to get it done. You give her something that's, that's a creative, something that's fresh, she's going to get it done. That's what I love about Holly. Shout out to Holly Carter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you had Preachers of LA. Then it went to pre Preachers of Detroit and uh, uh, Atlanta, what else? Preachers Atlanta? of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it turned into... Yeah, something. And the people have been asking about it for the last 10 years. And we just did a reunion. I saw. <laughs> and uh, I realized I, 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 I like the break I had. <laughs> you enjoyed the break. I enjoyed the break, man. So, someone was uh, noticeably absent from the reunion. <laughs> that was uh, uh, McClendon. Yes. Clarence. Yes. Clarence. You know, he's busy. He's just a busy guy, you know. That reunion was quite emotional, um, especially to hear the heart of Noel Jones in terms oh, of man, what drive or what drove the 14 year wait before saying, I'm gonna get married again. That's a real thing. I remember going to conventions, PAW conventions and watching Bishop Jones preach. Mm -hmm. He's a superstar in the church world, mm -hmm. you know? And for him to go through that divorce back then, it was hard for him. So you can't just be a bishop and respected in the church and just have a divorce and get married right away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's got to be some space there. Mm -hmm. Then, like he said, he has to reconcile in his mind if that's okay, because he's a theologian of theologians. So he's trying to process that. It just took him some time. And thank God he figured it out. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know uh, uh, Loretta appreciates that. <laughs> and, uh, and he's married now. So all is, you know, that's, that's done, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but there are people that like to hang on to the past. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's moved on. I love that. Now, the four of you ministers, men of God sitting there, of the four, three of you have been divorced. 
Wayne is divorced now. Yeah, that yes. just happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think sharing that, exposing that, putting that out there for people to see, what does that do for the kingdom? I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there are millions of people that, that, that married the wrong way that, or that married the wrong one the first time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of church kids do that because they, t they taught us, it's better to marry than to burn. You got a lust problem, you better marry that girl. <laughs> so we're like, oh, Lord. oh you yeah. know, let me get married. We go, you want to get married? Yeah, let's get married. You know, and you done rushed into something and it's short lived. Mm -hmm. And you realize that's not your soulmate. You just needed to get delivered from your lust problem. That's, that's how mm -hmm. you fix that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so a lot of people marry the wrong one the first time. And, uh, and uh, the second time and the third time. <laughs> this is true. Shout out to Mickey Stevenson. He, he goes to my church. Mickey Stevenson uh, launched Motown Records with Barry Gordy. Mm, Shout out to him. Nice. He's on his fifth marriage. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I like to sit and talk to him all day. He said, I loved every one of them, Dietrich. I gave, <laughs> I gave them each 15 years. He's 80 some years old. I gave them each 15 years. <laughs> I said, I hope this is the last one, Mickey. <laughs> Oh, wow, I tell you. And now we're going to have Preacher's Wedding Edition. Yes. What can yes. you tell us about what to expect? I don't want to spoil it for everybody, but it's a wedding. It's it's a bridezilla. It's all <laughs> that, that song's in it. It's all of that. <laughs> what makes you keep doing it? Why, why get exposed yourself like that? I think it's important, man. I think the reality TV is perfect for, pe for real people. Mm. I mean, you got to be real. That's what you're supposed to be as a preacher and be transparent. There's ministry and transparency. And so I'm a, I'm a believer in that, man, that, that uh, if you don't have nothing to hide, share it. Mm. It's going to help a whole lot of people than being secret. Yeah. You'd be surprised at things that men and women of God go through behind closed doors, but they'll never, they put on the front as if everything is perfect. They have all the right answers. You don't have all the answers. Mm. Stop that. You don't have, God is the one that has all the answers. You're trying to work it out. But we, but we need to come off as perfect for people to respect us. We thought that, but now we're finding people love the fact that you're telling them the truth mm. and you're being transparent. It's a, new, it's a new level. I think Preachers of LA kind of broke that thing for preachers to be free to say, hey look, we're going to work it out. God's going to, he's going to help us all. You know, there's nobody perfect here. And I'm hearing more of those messages now since preachers, you know. I spent significant time on a lot of my albums trying to prove to people that I knew God or I had a relationship with God or I was anointed. So I sung a lot to, to show people I got a God, I'm a anointed, you know. Now I feel like that's a waste of time. Music is a powerful tool to reach places where preachers will never go. Evangelists and prophets will never go. It hits the streets everywhere. Music is, is a gift from God that has no limitations. If you, if you have the right lyric, the right melody, the right spirit behind it, it can reach somebody that's getting ready to commit suicide. That would never step foot in the church. So why do I waste my time trying to say, oh, the glory in your, come on, anoint, be anointed. I, I, I stopped that. 